I'm Annie, your host, and I'm really excited this week to welcome Lisa Palasti to our interview series. Lisa is coming all the way from Ontario, Canada to chat with us. And Lisa is an RDI consultant amongst many of her other talents. And I have a friend working personally with her who sends the most amazing recommendations about her. So I'm really excited to get Lisa on to share her knowledge with us. So Lisa, would you like to start off by, for those watching who don't know about RDI, give us a little bit of a background of what RDI is, how it was founded and what it looks like. Sure, thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. And a little background around RDI. It's a kind of a, an interesting question because people often say, you know, can you give us a little rundown on, on RDI? And the challenge then is trying to create something that's concise and clear and short because it is a wonderfully comprehensive program. So I'll try to give you the, the elevator speech of what RDI is. First, let's say, what, it, what the RDI stands for. So Relationship Development Intervention. And it's a program that was founded by Dr. Gutstein and Dr. Sheely uh, back in, it was copyrighted, I believe back in 2000. I first learned about it in 2002 after he had, had um, published a couple of uh, his first books on the topic of RDI. And it is a developmental model that focuses on empowering and educating the parents because we believe that parents are the ones that can make the biggest difference in their children's lives. It's a developmental based program. So we're not looking at trying to extinguish behaviors that look like autism or reinforce behaviors that look like typical development in the hopes that we can create a child who looks like a typically developing child based on their behavior. Rather, we understand that behavior is a symptom of often a lagging step in development or as a communication. And so we, we look at um, where the child hit a wall in their development by doing a thorough assessment between parent and child and looking at the guiding relationship. And once we're able to uh, do that initial baseline, then the consultant will come in and they'll do um, some hypothesizing, some um, testing to further develop, determine where the child's developmental readiness is. And then we will help to help the parents learn how to begin, how to um, structure their environment, optimize, um, or evaluate, excuse me, their child's optimal learning environment, learning how to structure and set up activities uh, with their child, and uh, how to integrate the goals that we give to the parents, how to integrate those into their everyday meaningful experiences. Because RDI is also very um, much a part of, of being um, involved in engaged experiential learning with a more expert guide, which is usually the parents, but we can we often bring in grandparents and potentially some other um, caregivers or, or what we call RDI extenders. Hmm. Beautiful. So mm -hmm. I guess in the world of behavioral interventions, if we look at them as a whole, um, you sort of have at one end of the spectrum, the ABA type interventions where it's very therapist led, and um, the, it's kind of a lot of requesting what the therapist wants from the child. And then I look at RDI and floor time, it's kind of being way up the other end where it's extremely respectful of the child and their needs and where they're at and understanding that what they're doing, like you said, their behavior is a symptom of where they're at developmentally and it's, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a symptom of where they're at in their body. Um, and it's communication. So I think what I really love about these types of therapies is that it allows the parent to have such a better understanding of your child because your focus is not on stopping this and instigating that, it's on understanding, connecting, and using that to drive your child's development. 
Mm -hmm. That's very well said. That's exactly what it is. And it's a process uh, that is really recognized in how children typically develop. So rather than putting some kind of strange um, program in place that really limits what the potential can be for children, we're focused on building the mind. So Dr. Gutstein, the founder of RDI, says that parents become mind-minded. Mm -hmm. And remember earlier, I was telling you that I love some of the simplest things he says, but that's true. They become very mindful about helping to develop the mental processes and the mental habits and tools that children are going to require in order to experience a long-term quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that really spoke to me about RDI way back in 2003. So I'd heard about Dr. Gutstein in 2002. In 2003, I had the good luck to be able to see him in a, con in a workshop in Toronto. And I remember when he started to talk about the long-term quality of life uh, research that had been done and the outcomes. And he was, and he was speaking at that point specifically around um, those that have been diagnosed with high-functioning autism or Asperger's because often there's a misconception too that says if you have, a, oh, you'll be fine if you're HFA, you know, if you're high functioning autism, you know, and that, and that oh, there, you know, there, there, there's kids that need it much more. Well, it doesn't tell us how much or how hard these individuals are having to work mm -hmm. in order to try to function in the real world. But regardless whether a child is low functioning, um, or high functioning, what really drew me to Dr. Gutstein was the fact that he was talking about these long-term outcome studies. And I was able to like connect the dots. And I thought, if he's talking about it, that means he's put into place a program that's going to address it. Because prior to that, I, I didn't mention, but I'm also the parent of two children who are now young adults. They're, they're 20 they're soon to be 21 and 24, but they have benefited greatly from RDI. So back when they were just four and seven, I was still losing sleep at night, worrying about the long-term outcomes of the way that we were investing our time, all of our time and our, and our energy and our money then, which was through ABA and my son had learned a lot of the things that all their children knew, his colors and letters and numbers, and he knew to raise his hand while he was sitting in circle, but he never did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, he, they learned how to, we learned how to, you know, we tried to ex extinguish, you know, some behaviors that looked like autism, but that ended up becoming like whack-a-mole because, you know, just when you get rid of one, another one pops up. So, so we, you know, in RDI, we don't worry about that, which is actually really refreshing. And it's a very much a proactive approach because we know that development takes time. We know that we're building the neural integration in the brain, that we're giving children with, um, or individuals with autism, lots and lots of meaningful, authentic experiences. Mm, exactly. It's that authenticity and the meaning, meaningfulness behind it. And someone said to me on the weekend, um, that social emotional connection is the, the utmost importance because even in typically developing children, that's what drives their development. And children on the spectrum are no different. It's just that they have more of a challenge in that area. So when you're using a therapy that addresses that social emotional connection, that's going to be the most highly motivating for that child to really drive their progress. Most definitely, because if children don't feel safe, they are not going to be in a mental, um, they're not going to have the mental availability to, to learn. Mm -hmm. And so they feel the safest, safest typically with their parents, mm -hmm. children with autism. It just makes the most sense that the person that is going to be the most connected to the child emotionally, physiologically, biologically, um, they, they have the, the greatest capacity to really uh, co-regulate with a child, which, which means to, to attune to the child and to, to start to enter into that kind of
kind of back and forth um, uh, reciprocity of engagement. Parents have the ability to, to help a child develop greater self-regulation, which I was just reading something, I don't know, in the last 24 hours, it said self-regulation is the number one attribute needed for individuals to be successful yeah. in life. <clears throat> now, mind you, there, there's lots of them, but it's through the, the parent and child relationship that that develops. Yeah. And the trust that it builds, like that's something that's really been shown to me over the last few days, the trust that your child, you know, knows like, mum, she's got me, you know, she gets yes. me, she's got my back, she's here for me. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. I had a client one time tell me, they said, they'd only been working with me for a few months, but they said, my child loves you. And they were just a little shocked by it. And I actually said, yeah, they don't love me. They don't even know me. But what they do know, you know, not they don't know me well, but what they do know is how good they feel when they're with me because of the, of the opportunity for me to create co-regulation, create experiences that allow them to experience a sense of themselves, to experience their own autonomy, their own agency. And, and that feels good. And so when kids can start to build more and more of those, they do uh, begin to, to seek out more uh, opportunities for engagement with their, with their parents. With, it starts with their parents, but it, it will translate into, uh, it will generalize into um, in their motivations with their teachers and, and, and other people, as long as those environments are, are conducive to supporting the child's emotional and social development yeah. as long as they feel safe mm -hmm. yeah beautiful mm -hmm. okay so what are the general what are the philosophies and the, the guiding principles behind um, how RDI was developed well RDI is is kind of been um, how do I say this so how was it developed and where is it is today I often say it's very cutting edge Dr. Gutstein is, is, has done an exhaustive study of the research over the last two decades, and then he's considered what was good research, because research in a lab that's quite contrived sometimes, and depending on how it's put together, may not really demonstrate good research, but once he's determined um, the, what research is um, solid and it is um, consensual, meaning that there's other people that are also doing the similar bodies of research. Um, he will take that information and then put to practice uh, goals. He's, he's evolved our program to include some of those aspects into the program. So this means that there's a deviation from just trying to address those um, deficits that are listed in the DSMV, for example, because a lot of the, the characteristics that are described as being part of autism, it's not a comprehensive list. And it's, um, you know, we've, we've discovered a lot more about neuroscience and autism and typical development in the, just the last um, five years, or especially even in the last um, I was going to say, sorry, in the last 10 years, but especially in the last five. And so that's one of the things that I think that really sets RDI apart is, is taking the, the research and then putting that to clinical practice. So, um, and then focusing on the parents first and foremost is another thing that sets aside um, RDI is that we have a huge focus on developing the guiding relationship and helping parents to uh, recognize how they can help their children become um, who they're meant to be by carefully guided, scaffolded moments. And that scaffolding can mean that we can give the child some more supports or we can start to take them away as the child develops greater understanding because we're continually working at what we would call a one step one step ahead approach so that it's really manageable 
And that's where you said before, Anna, you said that the child feels like you really get me. And it's that combination of being able to, for parents, they know exactly where they left off and they know exactly where to pick up again, like nobody else does. And so they are able to create these guiding moments, learn to evaluate them afterwards, what was working, what didn't work, what questions might I have, how do I want to approach this the next time? And every time they do that, they start to develop greater competency as a guide. And we know that we need to have a competent guide before we can have, we refer to the individuals, the, the children or the young adults or, or teens as, um, as apprentices. So they don't start off as apprentices because they don't know what's at stake. Rather, most of the time, individuals with autism are, are often saying, no thanks, <laughs> because when you're being guided, you're being put into a situation of uncertainty, and, and, and that's scary for individuals with autism. They like to try to avoid that. So, um, so with that, scape, that, that safe, scaffolded learning opportunities, the parents develop into mentally agile guides, and the children develop into uh, motivated apprentices. Mm. Oh, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. It's, mm -hmm. um, if you know any of my work or the viewers will know that I'm a huge proponent of, as mothers, actually working on ourselves first so that we can then help our children. And that's across the board. That's in terms of mental health or self-care or just getting enough sleep or eating, you know, food that's going to fuel your body. Um, and you probably find in your experience that, you know, you're coming here to help a child, you're coming into this person's home to help their child, but probably a lot of your focus actually goes into helping the parents in terms of their state of mind and their mindset and their, how they're just managing life themselves. It's huge. It has to be our number one focus actually. And in our goal, in our goals that we have listed, we have them um, broken down into four major uh, goals. And goal one, two, and three are really all about parents. Mm -hmm. Parent education, parent empowerment, helping parents to make sure that they're taking time for themselves, taking time for their marriage, taking time for their children with ASD. Because we know that you can't be therapeutic every moment of the day, and that being in crisis is actually some of the, the behaviors that would, um, that would coincide with a parent who's still in that crisis stage. I mean, crisis is kind of a scary word, but- uh, to, realistic at times. Yeah, yeah. And so it could be, you know, having been, having been a parent, I'm still a parent, but having been a parent of newly diagnosed children, I can tell you that I spent a lot of late nights on the internet, you know, sometimes till three or four in the morning. And then in hindsight, it didn't serve me well at all. <laughs> I think today, though, it's even more problematic because there's, you know, that was 16, 17, 18 years ago. And so today there's, there's, you know, it, there's millions. I don't even know what the number would be, but the amount of information, it's crazy. It's, it's a huge yeah. overload. Yeah. So yes, we focus on that a great deal in terms of, you know, we can't expect a child to be regulated or to self-regulate if the parent's not self-regulated. Yeah. And so what does it take for the parent to, to get there? It's really important. And I feel so, like that's, that's a real missing link that we have at the moment, especially in the early days of diagnosis. It's, it's generally the focus all goes on to the child. Okay, we've got this diagnosis. What does the child need? Let's get A, B, C, D all happening <clears throat> but there's not there's not that focus you know oh mum you know make sure you're looking after yourself there's kind of a flip you know comment will be thrown in there that has no real foundational basis to it or 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 um you know really the the importance is not placed on it um and that's what i love about these therapies that bring the parents into it because it it can be an amazing learning opportunity for us as mothers if we can embrace it all. Um, and we will learn as much about ourselves in doing these therapies with our child as we will learn, you know, we will help ourselves as much as we will help our children. When you're in a situation where you go to ABA or a therapist-led intervention, you send your child off and then they come back and you go home, there's, it's like there's two separate worlds there and they never intertwine. 
And, and it's unfortunate, but sometimes I hear from families that have reached out to me with the comment that in their current programming or therapy model, whatever that may be, that they're not being included. And these parents desperately want to know what to do. I don't think that they want to be over-reliant on other professionals to help them raise their kids. Yeah. I think at the, at the, it, although it's a scary um, notion, I think for some parents, when they want to step into a developmental model that's parent focused, I think sometimes it's, it's, it doesn't mean they have to jump in with all their, you know, eggs in one basket right from the start. I really like to take the approach that I'm going to educate and empower the parents. So let's say if they're doing ABA as well, when they come to me to do RDI, I don't say to them, I can't do um, this with you while you're still doing that. But what I want to help you do is to make a really well-informed decision that that you've made mm -hmm. that you can trust in because you've become that educated mm -hmm. and so for some families it, it depends and one particular mom she decided to stop doing the aba that they were doing within a matter i think of two weeks and the other another mom that i worked with it took her six months but it was just their comfort zone i guess with making those decisions Still along the way, we try to make we try to support a team approach so that if, if families are working with other therapists, I definitely want them to make sure they have opportunities to observe. I'd like to observe. And that's true of the school situation too, or the preschool situation. I like to uh, have the opportunity to go in and observe in, in those environments so that I can help to inform the parent. I suggest that they observe and um, and then they can make those good decisions. Yeah, it's funny, I mentioned to you, we had an outreach on the weekend with a, um, a developmental play therapist and I invited my son's speech therapist and occupational therapist to come along and watch. So they both were able to come for about an hour and a half. And so they just sat there and observed. And when they left, they both said to him, I have never seen Jackson so engaged with another person. Uh, I have never seen him so calm and still. I have never seen him that uh, have that amount of interactive attention span. Um, they were just shocked at what sort of trust and rapport and relationship he built up within half a day with my son. Um, wow. so, yeah, so bringing in, you know, having all of your team, even though they're in different fields or different specialities, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be black and white or one or the other. Everyone's learning from everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> So we can try to build that. That's very important for sure, for sure. So would you like to tell us what would be um, some of the goals or activities or games that you may build into a program for a child doing RDI? Sure, so we talked already about the parent focus. And so often when the parent is beginning to try to learn how to modify their communication styles or their, um, even their, their pacing to help the child with processing or as, a, as an invitation. So that's, that's all in play early on. But what we find is that uh, those goals are also benefiting the child at the same time. So it's, uh, you know, the, it's a parallel process, I guess, as we're helping to build the parent's competency, the child's competency is also really starting to blossom. And so the type of activities that we could do. Ideally, what we would have fam families do is they would receive a goal from us as, as consultants based on our assessment of where the family's at or what is most important, that where they need to be getting, you know, what are the priorities? And then we would um, educate them about the goal because it's really important, I think, that families know why they're doing something versus, um, you know, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yeah. Well, you're going to have more investment if you know what the implications are for developing that um, in your child to, to fill in that developmental step or why this is so important. So sometimes, for an example, slowing down can feel counterproductive to families when they just want to, you know, they're in crisis and they just want to speed up and, and get their child to do something and, and fix this behavior and get rid of that because it all triggers me and makes me feel, you know, as a parent. So that's why we focus on parent self-regulation as well. But um, so some of the 
the, the goal will we'll give a parent a goal, they'll learn how to, to frame it. And this is thinking about how they're going to set up their environment, how they're going to plan the activity, how long it's going to take, what, what the child's role will be, what communication emphasis they'll use, what type of potential scaffolding they might use, what could potentially be a distraction, what are the child's action limitations, are is fine motor skill a challenge for them? Uh, just thinking about who they are, who's um, the child's strengths and challenges as we plan the engagement, those planned activities typically get videotaped and then we teach parents to learn how to begin to evaluate their work. And so it's like you're online in the moment and then afterwards you go offline to kind of consider and evaluate how things went. And through that process, you're learning in a way that things get missed when you're in the midst of moments, right? So as you take time to consider and learn, the, the families, um, they'll go through that process of evaluation under the careful guidance of a consultant so that it doesn't feel overwhelming. And, um, and eventually what happens is the guide develops into a really a mentally agile guide. And it's because they've taken that time to reflect and then they're able to access that learning more quickly when they're in the moment. It's in the moment learning that's kind of challenging. So an activity, we could look at play. Play can definitely be an activity, um, but we can also look at real world, uh, everyday routine types of things like baking or walking to the park. And depending on what the goal is, we can integrate that into the everyday experiences. And so uh, a goal, initial goal could be co-regulation, which is really helping the child and the parent to feel what it feels like to be in sync, to develop that synchronicity with um, each other so that they recognize when they don't have it because we want the child to start to feel what it feels like that's gonna build their motivation. And then when they don't have it, they're gonna recognize that too and they're gonna to start to be able to make repairs. So parents are also carefully guided as to when they can start to slow down more for their child to potentially make a repair. Because sometimes when children first begin with us, they're not capable of that. If they lose their attention or get distracted by something else, they will still need the parent to help redirect them and, and bring them back. It can just be a quick, a quick little spotlight um, on what they're doing, but it also may mean that you have to uh, kind of control the spatial boundaries a little bit more carefully with a child. Um, some of the goals that we often will work on could be nonverbal communication, which helps to promote uh, greater emotional attunement. It's a foundation for effective communication. As a communicator, we need to continually monitor our partners so that as we send information, we need to check in and see, did you comprehend what I just said? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with what I said? Okay, let's play, you know, whatever it is. But so that's a, a classic one that has so many um, elements to it, the not the nonverbal perspective taking, it's it's critical for understanding how do my actions impact your actions and what can I do about it. So it builds interpersonal agency or, or interpersonal confidence. Um, social referencing is it fits in there really well with nonverbal communication too, because um, children will often shift their gaze to their parent to receive feedback when they're faced with uncertainty. Our kids with autism don't know that they can do that. And so if we can help them to learn that they can understand their world better by using their gazing in a very meaningful way, then, then they, it, it seems to really help to further establish the guiding relationship and open up their worlds. So it's funny, I'll have a, a family that will ask me, you know, how can I help my child to, to um, be more interested in other people's perspectives? Or how can I help um, my child to pay better attention? 
And at the root of that is really nonverbal communication mm -hmm. is helping them start to understand that they can infer meaning by using their eyes in a way that helps them understand the world can be pretty empowering for a child. Mm, yeah. And I think mm -hmm. with that, with that social referencing, it just brings the other people into their world so much more because all of a sudden it's like, it's not just me enjoying this thing. It's like, Hey, like they're enjoying it and they're enjoying it. Or, you know, it's not just me who's worried about this thing or frightened by this thing. Or, you know, when you are frightened by this thing, it's like, Hey, I can, figure out what's going on by looking at this person it, it opens mm -hmm. up their awareness of everybody else in the room with them yeah it's huge so I was working with this one boy who would have such um such challenges with unexpected uh things that would happen at school such as outdoor recess is canceled they're having indoor recess or at one point I went in to observe the student and I thought it was an interesting exercise but they were they all had a dead fish that they had got to take a piece of paper to put on top of the fish and then draw with a crayon and it would kind of um, outline the anyway I thought it was quite interesting but it was also very smelly mm. so my the boy that I was there to observe he had a real sensory uh, an auditory aversion to things that smell bad as did I but anyway it was interesting because of that experience and having talked with his um, support team at school I said what we we should try to do is try to point out he had a couple of people that he was more a couple peers that he was more connected to that were really kind kids that he liked to hang out with so we said let's start pointing out that you know, Robbie's not crazy about indoor recess either. He looks pretty disappointed. And oh, Sarah's wrinkling up her nose at that fish. She thinks it's stinky too. So anyway, just even opening up his, his world in that way by pointing out, and this was some of the work we'd already been doing at home, but now let's elaborate this in a way that it didn't naturally translate for this child to that extent to think to do that for himself as part of his own self-regulation. But what happened was he started to not feel alone. Mm. He started to see like, oh, other people can feel the way that I feel too. And so in that way, it didn't have to be so unsettling for him. Yeah, absolutely. That's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess what I'm hearing is that if you're, if you're running a program at home, it's not necessarily going to be you know, you sit down for two hours and you do these really structured activities. It's more figuring out goals that are part of your lifestyle, figuring out how to um, how to motivate your child through doing things that you're doing in everyday life and using that to help your child stretch themselves a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're through those everyday real world experiences that we really want to try to build on. And that can be play or it can be chores. But I think that when I reflect back on my childhood, uh, I really wanted to do the things that my mom or my grandma or my great grandmother, you know, were doing. I remember having those memories. This is of the, what we call episodic memories of our um, younger, of our prior experience. We encourage parents to think about um, considering what they learned. As, as youngsters or even young adults, I also had a wonderful boss when I was in my early 20s that I think really mentored me in a beautiful way. But we, we do invite parents to, to think about those experiences because it helps them to understand it's a part of who they are and who they've become. And of course we want them to have that same relationship with their child. So we really want to anchor that in. So when we invite parents to think about how and where they're going to do RDI, we, we ask them, what are the things that you're already doing? What are, what are the things that your child is already doing? Because you can join them too. And, and uh, it doesn't mean, you know, an RDI, I think we, we have, a, we call it the guiding relationship, but sometimes it is following the child's lead until you can build that connection. And then you can make those little modifications just to stretch them that much more. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what are you already doing? What's the child already doing? What would you like to do? So with a distance client of mine, I mentioned earlier about the uh, great uh, distance in the very remote area that one of my clients lived in. 
But after we worked together for a while and everything was going really well, we started to explore different ways that they would expand the way that they spent time together. It turns out mom used to play piano. And so, and, and we didn't think that the boy would be able to participate in piano lessons that were terribly long. So we suggested, I suggested actually, why don't they split a lesson? And that way it's, a, you know, it's, it's, um, it's beneficial for the piano teacher as well, because she probably wouldn't want to have a student that would just come and maybe only spend 15 minutes, you know, at a time. But I think it did end up being half an hour and half an hour. Anyway, I can you imagine how, how um, wonderful I felt when the parents sent me the videos of she and her son each doing their own recital. And at the end of the of the boy's piece, her son's um, piece, he actually did this wonderful little bow like this, you know, and mom said, I didn't even tell him to do that, you know, but he was just in his full glory of being able to do that. So, yeah, so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be any one specific activity. Um, in fact, when Dr. Gutstein was asked a lot years ago when he used to do a lot of present, you know, he, he used to travel quite a bit, he used to do a lot of two-day workshops all across the, the world, and people would say, uh, can, just tell us an RDI activity. And he said, um, anything you can do when you're not dead. <laughs> but it can be. He just, he got a little bit concerned because it's actually a couple of his first books, Solving the Relationship Puzzle for, puzzle for Young Children. And then there was one Solving the Relationship Puzzle for um, Older Teens and Adults. There was two books, but they were primarily all about activities. And the downside of that was, in hindsight, was that people thought that to do RDI just meant that you did these activities mm -hmm. without the really strong understanding that the, the, the goal is, again, an, another simple saying, when we're doing RDI activities, we're always thinking about the goal underneath the goal. So if, if the goal was to make a uh, Christmas craft of some kind, this is like the, the, the um, obvious, apparent goal, but what's the underlying goal? Like, what are you working on? Are you working on co-regulation, coordinating actions, perspective taking, uh, problem solving, nonverbal, like, you know, what is it? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's, that's how we help parents. Mm -hmm. That can Sorry. be a real challenge for if you're a reformed perfectionist, A-type control freak mother like me. We are, uh, you know, in the beginning days where we were just going to our stock standard speech therapist and I would say, okay, so how many hours a week should I be doing these activities with my child? You know, yes. like literally th uh, at that stage, I was like, okay, so I'm uh, on Tuesdays, so, you know, from 10 till 2, I'm going to sit down and do these, you know, and then so to move into this whole other world of where it's a gray area and it's not necessarily completely structured and it's, um, it's not you do this and you do A, B, C and then you get the outcome of Z, you know. Um, yes. Being in this world of, um, yeah, not having, and like you said, not having that focus on the outcome, but just having the focus of what am I trying to do here? Yes, I'm trying to teach my child to make a Christmas craft, but really what I'm trying to do is just connect with them and understand them and show them that I love them. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a whole other world from being in that um, do A, B, C and get C sort of kind of thing to, yeah. oh, it's this. And, and even, you know, like what sort of, I could say to you, what sort of com time commitment is involved in this? Well, it's it's your life. It's It's little bits peppered throughout the day it's how you you know how he gets off the school bus it's it's just it's way it's a way of living as opposed to two hours that you do on a Tuesday morning that's really well said and I would have to say that it's one of the bigger challenges in RDI is that for you know it's for families to carve out time to to do this mm. so uh it, but it's really more about quality than quantity, once they can set aside the time to frame and plan their activities so that they can give them to their consultant to get the next steps, 
because it's got to be this process of continual learning and it's hard to know where the parents are at unless there is a collaboration yeah. with the consultant and so um but, but that process really helps them to be mindful so that they can start to feel like okay now i can take this beyond just doing social referencing laundry now i can do social referencing scavenger hunts or hide and seek i can do uh, social referencing at the grocery store or you know at the mall it's it's i think for parents it can become something that they get really hooked on as well when they start to experience their own momentum their own motivation their own competency it, it, it does help to propel them forward but yeah the amount of time is is kind of a it's just it's just a subjective you know how much is enough like how much do you want to parent mm. yeah and you know you want that, it yeah it's that that it's addressing that control that we can have in ourselves or that you know a lot of mums have struggle with guilt around i'm not doing enough have i done enough today have i spent enough time with my child have i given them enough attention so it's actually a way that we can learn to address in ourselves we are enough we are doing enough starting to learn for ourselves you know to to drop that feeling of i'm not doing enough i'm not taking them to enough therapies i'm not spending enough time with them all of that stuff is all working on ourselves. Yes, and also recognizing that less is more so that when our children are really overwhelmed and overscheduled, then they don't have the mental resources available to remediate the autism. Yeah. So that's really important. And the scheduling can be an important piece too, because as we, as you and I talked about, Anna, earlier, about the importance of the parent taking care of themselves that scheduling could actually say, okay, you know, considering how you're going to divide your time so that part of that is also taking time for, for you to refuel and to regroup and, and to feel available for your kid. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're in Canada. I'm in Australia. We were chatting earlier about how technology makes, opens up everything for us. So you mentioned you have some distance uh, clients that you work with and really with Skype and Zoom, it's quite easy to work with anyone all over the world. You know, you can film behaviors and film when you're playing with your child and share it with anybody that you need to. So for parents who are interested in finding out more about RDI, do you want to let us know if you can recommend some consultants nearby within Australia or how we can find some consultants and also if somebody's wanting to work with you how would that look sure so I think that it'd probably be best to speak to an RDI consultant in Australia to fully understand how the funding works there but as I understand RDI is funded in Australia and if you go to the RDI connect uh, this is the headquarters this is um, their their website rdiconnect.com, then you can find a consultant there. So there'll be consultants that will be listed in Australia, but you can put it within a certain um, uh, number of kilometers from your home. And you and I talked about that too, because you're still looking for one within <laughs> the 100 kilometers. And I've gave, given you a recommendation, but depending, because I know that Australia is a very, very big country. So perhaps um, people will be here from different parts of Australia. So I think that that would be the best um, suggestion that I would have would be to, to look at um, consultants from, uh, that might be in your area. But, but at the same time, I have worked with families at a distance and I've done so with uh, families when even a consultant might be closer to where they live. But I believe that part of that is because they felt that I was a good fit for them. Perhaps they saw me in a webinar or I was referred to them by maybe a, a, a client of, you know, previous client of mine, something like that. But that's something that I do recommend to families is to make sure that whoever you are going to work with, that you take the time and to, to interview them 
uh, because I, as I, I believe that all RDI consultants will offer at least one free uh, consultation. Uh, my process is actually I do a brief intake form, then we schedule the Zoom call or we answer any other questions. I get to know the family a little bit better, get to know more about the child. Then I will send them a listing of the different programs that I offer and then we generally come back together again to meet and discuss any questions they might have as a result of that or what program they feel might work best for them. And so it's a little bit um, more of an in-depth uh, process of, of um, consideration. So, so, but we do work really well with families at a distance. So even if there's not one right in your hometown, um, they, there will be somebody that you'll be able to find if you wanted to learn more about RDI. Um, perhaps there'll be workshops or conferences that may be coming up in your area. Um, and uh, I believe that there's a website have you seen it, Anna? I'm trying to think of what the name is exactly, but there's a website that is specific to uh, the Autism RDI consultants in Australia. Oh, okay. I, can... well, I know about the RDI Connect. Obviously, mm -hmm. I will um, link all of these up on the web page. With the okay. Website, and I'll have a look yes. at the Australian specific. Yes. Um, I've probably been on it 10 times and don't even. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think if you just typed in RDI Consultants Australia, it would come up. It's just that I know that they had two at one time, and I think one is is more of the recent one. I don't know if the, the last one is still active, but they do. The lovely thing, too, is that they do work together quite beautifully, and I think that they have conferences where they get together, just even though they're all self-employed, they have conferences where they all get together quite regularly. And then as far as myself is concerned, I'm going to be launching a... I'm going to be launching a, an introductory level online parent training for RDI. And so if people are wanting to learn a little bit more about RDI, not sure if they want to let you know, jump right in and take the plunge with, uh, with a consultant, this would be a really good first step. And that will be launched at the end of January, on January 30th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So 8 p.m. Eastern time would probably, you're in Melbourne, would probably be about five o'clock, sorry, noon. <laughs> you're about eight. You know what? I'm going to have to look at the calendar on that. I'm just trying to go by our meeting here tonight. But yeah, I think it would be, it would work anyway. Are going to be live trainings? <laughs> It'll be live trainings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And lots of video examples of the topics and some of the core concepts of RDI, how to frame your activities, the uh, mindful communication, uh, understanding growth seeking and how we want children to develop a growth seeking mindset and how that develops through the RDI program. Because if we can help our children start to want to seek out challenges and start to really want to learn, then everything else just becomes so much easier. Yeah, 100. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in those live trainings, is there opportunity for questions? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be an hour and a half each. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm just going to be uh, launching the information uh, in the next, there's already some information on my website. And my website is uh, www.mindfulguideconsulting.com. And so there's a parent training page, and I suspect that we'll link that as well yeah. to this. And so people can check out that um, information for um, that site. They can sign up for emails to receive information as it comes uh, yeah. to learn more about the parent training. Mm -hmm. cool. Now, I just yeah. want to get back to something you mentioned about funding. Um, so there are people watching from many countries, but... For Australian specific, I just want to let the mums know that with NDIS funding, um, you need, if you're self-managed, you're very flexible in terms of what you can spend your funds on. So if you can show that your RDI program is going to be working towards your child's goals, um, 
then absolutely you can use your funding towards it. If you're agency managed, um, you probably need to speak with your agency about that or speak with your planner. Um, but it's quite well recognised around the world, RDI, and I can't really see any reason why you wouldn't be able to use NDIS funding towards this. And another way that I know parents have been using their funding is with um, therapy assistance, or also known as allied health assistance, where you pay it's around $45, or if you're self-managed, you can negotiate the rate, um, to have students, OT students, speech students, psych students, anyone who's in allied health training, um, who can come and implement these games, activities, therapies, whatever your goals that you're working on with your child, so that even when you're cooking dinner, you can have someone who's getting more contact time with your child working on your program. Um, so that's something that we've been using over the past year with our therapy assistants, and um, doubles up as a little bit of respite for mum, which we always like. Um, and if you're doing RDI, you'd be cooking with your child and then using the respite to maybe go to yoga class. That too, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now you also, I, I asked you if you had some case studies or some experiences that you wanted to share with us and you mentioned that you've got um, a seminar or a webinar coming up where you're showing some sort of before and after information. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes, I just recently did that this fall and it's actually already recorded so I'll be sure to send the link to you and then you can add this. And, and at the end of the interview, if people want to take a look and learn more, there is uh, three different families of varying ages um, and at least three. Sorry, I'm, I'm going by memory here. There might be four, but boys, girls, varying ages from just wee, wee little ones to uh, teenagers and showing, demonstrating before RDI and then after the child develops more of the growth seeking mindset after the guiding relationship has been established, then what you'll get to see is the remarkable difference, not only in the children's states of regulation and availability for learning and their, you know, their, their ability to really uh, experience their own sense of self and what they can do because we're always co-participating with the kids but you'll see the parents are just so much calmer and and more regulated as well because they they have that meeting of the minds mm. so that's primarily what the whole webinar is about is these beautiful before and afters and some understanding about what it takes to help a child to develop a growth seeking mindset mm. yeah and that's great mm -hmm. you put that together because um in the you know over a long sort of what sort of time frame is it the before and afters do you know yes they vary and i speak about it in the workshop so sometimes it's just um, on average i would say about about a year yeah okay. about a year that we really start to see the, the difference children start to relinquish their need to control or resist or avoid guided opportunities in favor of appreciating who they are and who they're becoming through the relationship with their trusted guide mm. that they're emotionally connected to so it's really beautiful because this is intrinsic motivation and children aren't requiring you know um, some kind of a, a reward to engage yeah yeah because that's not how the world works. No, it's not. I know I had come from ABA myself and that, you know, that was, that really had an impact on my son in terms of the way that he perceived the world. Conversations were about you asking me a question and I have to go through my Rolodex of answers and if I can come up with the right answer, then we're okay but it didn't allow him the freedom to communicate in a way that was authentic about his own thoughts and feelings and ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, shortly thereafter, we're still transitioning into the RDI and actually it was a good year and a half after, but there was some residual stuff that was still lingering around from intensive ABA for three years. And so my son said to me one day, well, we were gonna unload the dishwasher together. And he said, well, what do I get? And I said, well, you know what you get? You get to be a member of this family. That's what you get. 
<laughs> that's so it's great to life. yeah to my normalize. Boy. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I'm out with my four year old at the moment. It's about this thing. <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Um, because I want to live in this house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're just trying to really normalize everything, but we have to do it when we have kids with challenges and not just children with autism, but um, RDIs, because it's it's based on um, neurotypical development. And then looking where a child hit a wall in their neurotypical development and then trying to help, you know, build those foundations stronger um it, it's just so effective with so many with with so many kids mm, beautiful mm -hmm. well i want to thank you so much for your time today um everything that was spoken about today i'm going to link up on your web page um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you obviously I'll have your contact details in there and your social media um, as I mentioned earlier I have a friend who is working with you and she only has the most amazing things to say about what she's learned from you and how it's impacting her child her relationship with her child all of that beautiful stuff so I really appreciate that you've put this time aside for us today is there um, a little message that you'd like to leave with our viewers today well, thank you, first of all, for having me. And gosh, what kind of message? I, I think that I, the two things. One is that parents really do make the most sense to be the primary person in the child's life. So um, get empowered, get educated, learn how you can make the difference in your child's life and um, grow that relationship. It's really, you know, why you had children. You always wanted to have that close connected relationship that, so you could help your child grow. And that growth is possible and that we just don't ever want to um, set any kind of limitations on who our kids can become mm. because it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's all part of a process. And, and growth is possible. So thank you. Beautiful. Okay, mm -hmm. well, thank you again for your time. And um, I'm wishing you all the best. And thank you. I hope lots of mums watching today feel inspired to reach out and maybe look for some RDI consultants in their area. Um, have a little, you know, pop your toe into this world of um, relationship development intervention. Um, I feel like it's really... For our kids, it's really the most motivating. It's the best way forward, really, for them um, to learn real world um, skills, how to connect, using that, that social connection to drive their development. And that's what really underpins being a human, you know, <laughs> being mm -hmm. social. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on the interview series. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.